I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, tonight's program. Um, <clears throat> our program um, has long been a partnership with the Teton County Library and the Library Foundation. Uh, and um, as a result of that, we ask you to remember the library, the Library Foundation, and geologists at Jackson Hole during the ongoing Old Bills um, fundraising uh, program. So geologists at Jackson Hole programs are part of the science slash nature Tuesday evening programs at the Teton County Library. And of course, we're not at the library now as a result of the ongoing pandemic. So uh, we are reaching you via Zoom. Uh, we do hope to uh, be back to the Teton County Library before too, too long. Uh, but I have to admit that your guess on that uh, timing is as good as mine. Um, I guess my guess is uh, early next year. So we'll, we'll see how good that uh, prediction holds up. The next program on, the, uh, on our agenda is on September 1st, the first Tuesday of uh, September. And uh, Dr. Simone Runyon of the University of Wyoming will be talking about uh, the ores of Wyoming, uh, which is something both significant to the state uh, and actually significant to the country as a whole. So that should be uh, a pretty interesting program. So uh, let me go ahead then and briefly introduce uh, Dr. L.J. Krumenacher, who is our speaker tonight. And uh, L.J has a bachelor's in biology and geology as a minor, master's in geology and a PhD in earth sciences. And those are respectively from Idaho State University, BUIU uh, Provost and uh, Montana State University. He's an affiliate faculty member at both uh, Idaho State University and the uh, College of Eastern Idaho. And uh, perhaps uh, most importantly, he's the father of two great kids. So now um, I'd like to turn it over to LJ and we'll be entertained and very much informed by a great story about finding dinosaurs in Idaho. LJ. Oh, hey, thank you, John. And thank you everyone for uh, attending digitally here. Let me go ahead and share the screen and start the presentation here, so. Okay, here we are. Okay, hopefully everyone's seeing that. So just starting off, so the title of the talk again, as mentioned, is Idaho Dinosaurs. They dug their own grave. That is a takeaway message, and you'll understand what the heck I'm talking about as we get towards the end of this presentation. Okay, so just to start off, um, as a kid, I was always a dinosaur nerd. Clear back in uh, middle school, I started collecting fossils, wanting to look for dinosaurs. I remember in one of the uh, first books I found on Idaho geology, I was really disappointed to find out that supposedly we didn't have any dinosaur fossils in Idaho. Um, as I went on to high school, that was basically the same. Then as I started college, it turned out a few little Idaho dinosaur fossils had been found, but they were so crappy that no one could even tell what sort of animal they were. So talking to my undergrad advisor there at the time, he suggested that I well, see if I could prove anyone wrong and find the dinosaurs. So I started looking and ever since then, my life has just gone uh, downhill. Okay, so to start off, my background. So as mentioned, I went to Idaho State University and I always have to shout out uh, my mentors that uh, got me to where I am today. So at Idaho State, I worked with Dr. Bill Ackerston right here at the top. Bill just retired few years ago, and he was a paleontologist that works on saber-toothed cats. He is the guy that suggested that I look for Idaho dinosaurs. He told me where to look and just kind of sent me out there, and away I went. Sorry. Okay. Then I went to BYU Provo, graduated in 2010. I worked with the uh, eccentric Dr. Brooks Britt. If anyone knows Brooks, um, you can always hassle him for me, give him a little crap, say it's from LJ. Um, he's a good guy. He helped me with my master's degree. He specializes on a bunch of dinosaurs from Utah. And then from 2012 to 2017, I worked with Dr. Dave Riccio. Dave is a great guy. His specialty is dinosaur eggs and social behavior up at Montana State University. Currently, I am affiliate faculty at Idaho State University in the geosciences department. I teach a class called Real Monsters that reviews critical thinking and how to make a good scientific argument through the lens of uh, fossil animals. 
I teach at the uh, College of Eastern Idaho, uh, general geology, and I teach a bunch of rowdy seventh graders at Mountain View Middle School in Blackfoot. Uh, my goal is to hopefully eventually find a full-time professor uh, position. So getting into the rocks. So to start off with, the rocks that we find Idaho dinosaurs in are called the Wayan Formation. To give you a little bit of background, if you know your regional geology, the Wayan is equivalent to the Mustn't-Touch-It member of the Cedar Mountain Formation of Central Utah. You get this out in the San Rafael Swell. And I'll just uh, call the Cedar Mountain Formation. If you see CMF, that just means Cedar Mountain Formation. We'll be talking about the Mustn't-Touch-It. So the Wayan is the same age as the Mustn't-Touch-It. Also, if anyone's been in southwestern Montana near uh, Lima Peaks, you have a uh, rock unit called the Vaughn. It's a Vaughn member of the Blackleaf Formation. We all know how uh, maybe state line geology works, where as soon as you cross a state line, the name of a uh, rock formation changes. When you cross the line into Montana, the Wayan becomes the Vaughn. Give you some uh, background where the Wayan occurs in uh, the stratigraphic column as far as uh, where the Wayan fits in other packets of rocks. The Wayan is just below what's called the Sage Junction Formation or the Frontier Formation, depending where you are in the state. That's a bunch of sandstones, about 93 million years old. Below the Wayan, you get what's called the Smith Formation, which is kind of an oceanfront property formation deposited along the edges of some beaches and an inland sea. As far as where we get these uh, Cretaceous Age rocks that we find these dinosaurs in, about 95 million years old, they are right in the thrust belt of eastern Idaho, kind of east of Idaho Falls and southeast of Idaho Falls. This isn't the best image, I'm sorry, but you can kind of see right through here is where we get the uh, Dinosaur Age rocks that I work in, out in the Caribou Mountains, basically. Give you a little uh, bit better idea where I work. So here's Idaho Falls. Here's where I'm talking to you right now from Blackfoot. Basically out here, there's a number of localities in the Caribou Mountains right here, just west of Palisades Reservoir where I work. Um, there's a number of unexplored localities and outcrops I need to look at, um, basically east of Idaho Falls that I'm working on. Biggest problem, finding Idaho dinosaurs outcrops. I wish I could uh, just see everyone uh, in person right now and say, raise your hand if you've been to Utah and seen the nice rock outcrops you get of the uh, Mesozoic sections there in central Utah. I'm guessing everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people have been down there. And you know that there's lots of rocks right here on the left. This is a mustn't touch it member again of the Cedar Mountain Formation. You see here's a sagebrush, a little bit of sagebrush. Look at all this beautiful rock as far as the eye can see, just rock for a dinosaur nerd to wander through and look for stuff. Okay, this is Utah again. Here on the right, this is Idaho Wayan Formation. Polar opposite. Look at all the green stuff, all the plants you can see. And you can see there's not a lot of rock to look at. This little outcrop here is actually the best outcrop of Wayan Formation that we have in Idaho. And you can walk across this in about three or four minutes. So that's one of the biggest things. For finding dinosaurs in Idaho, it's really hard to actually find good outcrops. You have to spend a lot of your time wandering around prospecting for outcrops before you can prospect the outcrops for fossils. Unofficially, I always think it'd be really nice to have some big wildfire go through here, make some bad lands, but I'm not officially hoping for such a thing. But I would love more exposures of these rocks. So the Wayan Formation. Um, it is named after the little tiny town of Wayan there in, I think it's right in northernmost Caribou County. Um, it's just basically a post office and a little old school. The Wayan Formation is made out of muds, sands, and silts that flooded out of rivers about 95 to 100 million years ago. It is ridiculously thick for a rock formation. When I did my uh, master's thesis at BYU, student and I came out and we tried to measure section which was fairly hard because it's not well exposed, but our best guess is the way in from top to bottom is about 1,344 meters thick. So it's getting close to being a mile thick. That is ridiculous for uh, some rock units. And age, if you know your uh, Cretaceous stages, I wanna be really technical here, 
It's late Albion to Cinnamanian. So again, maybe about 100 million years old to 95 million years old. We got those dates from using uh, detrital zircons, looking at the uranium and the decay, doing a little bit of fancy math and figuring out about 95 million years for these rocks, give or take. Just to point out again here, that outcrop I showed you guys a minute ago, this is that same outcrop. Again, this is the best that it gets in Idaho, this one little spot. You can even see, if you see my blue backpack that I'm circling right here, that blue backpack is where I dug up a, a nice little Erectodromius dinosaur fossil. I'll tell you what the heck Erectodromius is in a few minutes. As far as what uh, Idaho was like about 100 million years ago. So in Jackson there, you can see you'd be just underwater. If you were to come here into eastern Idaho, it would be beachfront property. Go a little bit farther west about to where Idaho Falls is now. You'd be getting up into highlands and hills. A little bit farther west, you'd get into mountains. So you had highlands that were associated with the severe thrust, the Paris and Mead thrust of the severe. You had mountains to the west. You had a narrow alluvial plain after those mountains. And just to the east, you had your seaway here again, your Maori seaway, where uh, you'd have some ammonites and mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and all those cool marine reptiles would inhabit the sea. I think it would be pretty cool if I could go back and see this and just kind of spend a day on the uh, Idaho beach 100 million years ago. As far as the climate at this time, it was monsoonal. What I mean by monsoonal is you had a distinct wet season and a distinct dry season. You can tell this from the uh, rocks in the way in. I don't know if uh, some of you guys know what calcareous nodules are, but these are nodules that form as the water table goes up and down and as water evaporates and precipitates calcium. And these uh, calcareous nodules will form as the water goes up and down. And that tells you you had wet season, dry season. The way in is full of these nodules. So you can tell that part of the year You'd have a lot of rain. Part of the year, it would be super dry, maybe something like you'd uh, see in Africa. I mentioned the uh, Mustn't Touch It, member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. Oops. Uh, here is a nice diagram just to give you an idea of uh, where it fits in in the Cedar Mountain Formation of Utah. So the Mustn't Touch It is the top of the Cedar Mountain Formation. The reason I'm showing this to you right here is what I'm circling right here where it says the Mustn't Touch It has many bone sites. The Mustn't Touch It is, again, the same age as the Way An, maybe 200 miles south of uh, the Way An Formation itself, but same age, a little bit wetter environment, but there are over 100 different animals that are known from the Mustn't Touch It. And that is awesome, and the Way An is not that lucky, and we'll get into that in a few minutes to uh, make it a little bit more relevant. Okay, here's my dinosaur baby. This is the one I'm very, very proud of. I'm so happy to know we have it. It's called Erictodromius. Ericto is Greek. If you translate it, Ericto means digging. Dromius means runner. So Erictodromius is digging runner. And I didn't put the species name on this slide, but it's cubicularis. That means of the lair. So if you translate this dinosaur's name, it's digging runner of the lair. And I'll tell you why it's named that in just a minute. This dinosaur is known from Idaho and Montana, known from the Wayan Formation in Idaho, and the Vaughn Formation, or sorry, Vaughn member of the Blackleaf Formation in Montana. I was really excited when we first started finding Erectodromius in Idaho. This is before it was named. I thought I had a brand new species of dinosaur. I was going to get to name it for my master's thesis. I was super, super excited. I went to MSU. I met my future PhD advisor. I saw a dinosaur that he got from the Vaughn. I looked at my bones, I looked at his, oh, it is the exact same thing. So he beat me out on getting, on getting to name the animal, but I think he did a really good name. I love digging runner. Erectodromius is known from 45, give or take, last time I did a tally, fossil localities in Idaho. So there's 45 spots where I found at least one little bone or partial bone that we can identify as Erectodromius. Uh, there's a few spots where we've got some good skeletons. This is a small plant eater. He's a bipedal ornithischian, meaning that he's a two-legged dinosaur that is related to animals like Triceratops and the duckbill dinosaurs. This animal is by far the most common Idaho dinosaur. He is by far, if you were to go out in the way in and spend a few days and you finally found something, 
it would most likely be an erectodromous bone. We have about 15 skeletons of this animal and dozens of isolated bones. Um, we've got so many skeletons of this animal that I still have a beautiful one that I need to get uh, prepared and cleaned out of the rock. I wish I had a picture of it here. I just haven't had the uh, means to do it yet. But this skeleton, you've got the legs curled up under the butt of the animal and the hips and arms going out. And it looks like he's just roadkill in the rock, but I haven't been able to prepare it out yet. Uh, this little drawing that I did right here shows you what a rictodromius looks like. Um, he's not a big dinosaur. He would be about 11 feet long and seven feet of that would be tail. Um, his head would be maybe six inches long for a grown up. You've got two kiddos right here in the bottom of the picture. Okay, digging runner. The reason Erectotromius is called the digging runner is this is the first known dinosaur that dug burrows. This is great information. This, people used to say dinosaurs didn't burrow and, and I'd read articles, they'd say, well, that's one of these weird ecological habits that uh, dinosaurs apparently never got was uh, living in burrows like we see animals today, like squirrels and rabbits and other animals doing well. When my advisor found his Erectodromius specimen up near Lima Peaks, he dug it out and it was in this red mudstone, this red clay stone. You can see right here, if you guys can see where my cursor is going, you see this sinuous white tube. This was a sandstone tube that curves through layers of mudstone. You can see it here after they've excavated some of the bones. Here you can see a diagram of what you're seeing up above here. So here's these green and red mudstone layers and you have this sandstone tube. The bones of an adult Erectodromius and two teenagers, younger Erectodromius were found right here in the very bottom of the burrow. So this is the first example um, ever known of a dinosaur that actually burrowed and based on the evidence of the kids being down there, it's a place that it raised its kids and it took care of its kids to protect them from predators. Maybe Erectodromius was down in this burrow as well to avoid a climatic excre extremes. Maybe during the dry season, it was super hot and he would hide down here where it's cooler with the kids to avoid the extreme weather. It was really disappointing because as I kept finding Erectodromius skeletons in Idaho, we could never find a burrow. I'd been finding them for about 10 years from the time I found the first one before we finally found a burrow. I think part of that reason is um, if a burrow fills with the same sediment that makes up the rest of the rock, it's gonna be really hard to recognize it. Um, but one day we got lucky. I was teaching with my advisor a paleontology field course at uh, Montana State University. We were out in the Caribou Mountains looking at that nice little outcrop I showed you. My advisor, if you see my cursor down here, was standing up on this little hill talking to students and I was nosing around behind him. I found a little Erectodromius tailbone on the ground, then another one. And I could tell that, okay, something's coming out of the hill here. So we came back the next year, we uncovered the bones, we put a plaster jacket on them. You can see the plaster jacket edging right here. Couldn't see a hint of a burrow around it. I said, okay, we were bummed out again, no burrow. We uh, collected the jacket. And in process of doing that, we noticed this weird round rock behind the jacket right here. And I'm like, well, that's weird. I'm like, is this just a big nodule or concretion? I'm like, okay, we want to investigate this. So I excavated this concretion or nodule. And lo and behold, it turned into this structure right here. So you're seeing the end right here. And it just kept going and going. Then it did a little S turn like Dave's burrow. Then it went up to this layer where it was truncated, where it was cut and destroyed by a new layer of rock that was deposited on top of it. So you can see my diagram right here. Okay, I'm gonna try something here. Hopefully it doesn't mess anything up. I'm gonna bring up a second link and then we'll get back into my slideshow. I have a nice 3D model of this burrow and I'll rotate it and show it to you guys here. So let's, I gotta reshare my screen and Let's see if this works. Okay, nod your head if you guys are seeing where it says loading 3D model. Has everyone seen it? Is this model showing up for people? Okay, 
Here's the burrow. You can see my rock hammer for scale. This is a photogrammetric model. So I had a colleague that came out and he took hundreds and hundreds of photographs of this burrow. And you can put those in a computer program and make a 3D model of it. So here's that end that you guys saw that I'm circling right here. Here's that burrow, here's the hammer. But you can see, here it is from right on top. There's a little bit of a curve. If you look at it this way too, you can see that S curve where it goes up right here, comes up here, and then it was too weathered. This was the top of the hill where it just was rotten and there wasn't anything left and preserved. This portion right here of the burrow that you can see, I hate to admit it, but before we knew it was a burrow, I think we removed that chunk of rock as we were excavating the skeleton down here because of where it was. So I think we took a little chunk out before we found the rest of this burrow. But um, if someone is interested in this uh, link to this or the paper describing this, um, shoot me an email for my contact information on the uh, first slide and I can send you the paper and the link to this. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute, go back to my presentation and get back in it here, so. Give me just a sec. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so that was a burrow. Tell you a little bit about erectodromous growth. Um, as part of my PhD dissertation at MSU, and I'm still working on, I need to do my revisions and get this in for peer review. We did some histology on erectodromous. Histology is where you look at the bones to figure out how old the animals were. So we took the uh, two kids that were found in the first burrow that they found, and they had two little shin bones, two tibiae. And we cut a tiny section out of each of those. Um, we took some specimens from Idaho that I'd found that were medium sized, took a section out of a thigh bone, then did that with some more tibiae and uh, thigh bones from some adults from Montana. And it's basically like a tree. You're going to count the rings in the bone, and if it's well preserved enough, it's going to give you a minimum age, excuse me, minimum age of the animals. The kids in the burrow, they were less than a year old, as best we can tell. So they were really young. Those two kids found with the first specimen were just uh, little kiddos, less than a year old. Uh, some specimens from Idaho we had were less than five years old, probably about four years old. Uh, biggest one that we have from Montana that this uh, reconstruction is based on, it was older than six is our best guesstimate. And that was just from looking at rings in the bone. The image you see right here, I just think it's cool. I have it printed out and hanging on my wall, but this is a microscope image of one of the middle-aged, one of these less than five-year-old erectodromias. These are the osteons, the bone cells, in that thigh bone under polarized light. You can see the different cells, and I just love the colors. I think it looks awesome. I'm really proud of this reconstruction down here. If you go to Montana State University, to the Museum of Paleontology, uh, myself and my colleagues, we made this exhibit of erectodromias. On this side, it's fleshed out. And it's funny, it cuts off the tail, but you know, add on maybe another third, you can see how long this uh, tail is. This side is fleshed out. The other side is the actual skeleton, but I was quite proud of that exhibit. Okay, so this just made me happy. So starting out as an undergrad at ISU and a kid in middle school, they said Idaho has no dinosaurs. Finally, we managed to find Erectodromius, show Idaho at least has one cool little dinosaur. Last year, the uh, Idaho Museum of Natural History, we did a, uh, sorry, two years ago, we did a summer camp, brought in middle schoolers, middle schoolers, and they sculpted erectodromous bones based on my PhD dissertation and had me there to make sure they're the right shape and size. And we put together the skeletal mount. So if you go to the Idaho Museum of Natural History, you can see this exhibit with the adult erectodromous and the little kiddo here that's chasing the dragonfly, which I think is a pretty cool exhibit. Okay, so Erectodromius, the most common Idaho dinosaur. The uh, second most common thing, it is what's called an oviraptorosaur. This animal is known from 31 localities where we have found fossils from it. Here's the clincher though. We have never found a single stinking bone from this animal. It drives me nuts because of how it looks right here. And because we haven't found a single bone, I call it the boneless chicken. Look at the ridiculous size though. Um, so you're probably sitting here wondering, how the heck does uh, LJ know this is an oviraptorosaur if he hasn't found any bones? We have found eggshell, 
eggshell at many, many places and really crappy pancaked eggs. If you look at this image here from uh, my colleague, uh, Jade Simon's paper. So these came from uh, easternmost Idaho, a little hill, a friend and I found. Here's an egg, what's left of it? Smashed, you can see the interpretive drawing right here. Here's a partial egg, you can see the interpretive drawing here. These things are about 15 inches long. They are huge dinosaur eggs. They make a hell of an omelet if you wanted it for breakfast. But we know these are from oviraptorosaurs because in China, in rocks of the same age, you get the same eggs with the same sort of eggshell and they found babies in it. Um, in the Cedar Mountain Formation in the Mustn't Touch It, it's not published yet, but they get these same eggs as well and they've actually found some bones from their oviraptor source, or probably the same one we had in Idaho. And this oviraptor source that was laying these eggs based on the specimen from Utah, just its shin bone, its tibia, is I think about four feet long. So this guy is huge. Uh, what I wouldn't do to be able to find a skeleton of this guy and know more about it. But that's our Idaho uh, boneless chicken. Okay, so the way in, it's weird. The fossils that we find there compared to other places we find dinosaurs, um, it's just not normal. It's just not right. There's something strange going on because of what we do find and what we don't find. So anything other than Erectodromia skeletons or these uh, Oviraptorosaur eggs and eggshells, which are called macroelongatulithus, I'll just call them macros to save myself a few syllables. Anything other than Ericto or macro are super duper rare, almost impossible to find. I've been out there for 20 years and maybe 3% of the time, you'll find something other than a ricto or macro. Usually, if you're to go to the nice dinosaur beds in Utah, say in the Morrison Formation or the Hell Creek of Montana, you're gonna find lots of big dinosaurs like Triceratops, T-Rex, or your sauropods, things like that. Though we know we're out here in Idaho, we don't find them. Something weird's going on in the environment where what should be the most common fossils are the most rare, and what should be the most rare are the most common. Animals like Erectodromius, I mentioned this guy is, uh, you know, 11 feet long. He's about three feet tall at the hip. His bones are hollow. These are animals that should not preserve his fossils very well because they're small, their bones break easy. But instead, they're mostly what we find. So tying into uh, other animals, uh, we have what's called the Robison bone bed. So I have a mentor. I wish I would remember to put his picture in here, uh, Steve Robison. He was a paleontologist with Caribou Targhee National Forest. And he showed me this site in, oh goodness, I don't even remember, maybe 2005, 2006. At the time, this site was just a hill covered in sagebrush like everything else. But there was a little knob of rock poking out. It was a really coarse conglomerate. And we noticed there was bone in it, but the rock was too hard to get it out. Um, so we just left it there. Flash forward 10 years to 2014, I think it was. I come out, I'm doing my summer rounds, checking out locations, and I notice that on top of this hill, there's a whole bunch of stakes for construction. In fact, you can still see one up there. So I get a hold of the Forest Service, talk to them. It turns out they're going to mine this hill in this uh, coarse conglomerate to crush and use as a road fill out on the Forest Service lands. Um, I raised some concerns and the Forest Service was great. They said, okay, when we dig this up, you can come out and monitor. We'll set aside a bunch of the rock for you and you can see what fossils are in it so you can salvage them. Most every dinosaur we know of from Idaho, other than a Richter macro, comes from this spot. So this little spot, um, especially thanks to the Forest Service for helping out, this little spot showed a lot of diversity in the land formation that we didn't know anything about, including what will probably be some new species. <clears throat> Just give you an idea of new discoveries. So we've got a bunch of typical dinosaurs that we found in the way in recently. I'll go through each of these, including some of our little uh, ancestral fur balls right here, including a new species we got to name recently. Um, as I mentioned, most fossils that aren't a ricto or a macro eggs are extremely crappy and fragmentary. Um, something that really piques my interest is a very large crocodile. Okay, we found this in uh, the Tin Cup Canyon area of Caribou County. And this is part of the skull down here on the bottom. It's part of the maxilla. The teeth are bigger than your thumb. Here's part of the uh, pre-maxilla. This is a huge crocodilia form that would have been at least 20 feet long, judging by the skull. I'm working on describing it right now with Randy Ermis. 
at the uh, Utah Museum of Natural History. This guy was similar to Delta Sucus. It's known from Texas. And also, it appears to be similar to a Dinosuchus. Dinosuchus is a monster crocodile from rocks that are a little bit younger. Um, that's um, found in Texas and North America. This is the size of Dinosuchus. You know, here's a normal person. Our Idaho croc cut off two meters here, cut off right here. And he would be just a little bit smaller than this guy. This is a monster crocodile. Unfortunately, all we have are these skull chunks. When they built the uh, highway going through that area, uh, most of the highway took the fossil with it because I found what was left in the road cut here. We also have cute little puppy-sized crocodiles. Um, this is another one that Randy from the Utah Museum and myself are describing. This is a brain case. So you see this weird looking lump here with all the little pits in it. <clears throat> that is the top of the skull of a little puppy-sized crocodile. And this little uh, crocodile is similar to similar uh, crocodiliforms from Asia, one called Gobiasuchus and one from uh, Spain called the Las Hoyas crocodiliform. But this is a cute little guy and it's again a, probably a, a new species and something that's possible with this guy, when you think of crocodiles today, you think of them with their legs sprawled out, you know, maybe awkward moving, they can still run faster than you if they wanna catch you and eat you. But this guy was probably a little thing similar to a crocodile crossed with a cat that would run around and be a little bit easier running around on the land and not so water dependent. <clears throat> Fur balls. I very, know very little about mammals, but it turns out from the Robison bone bed and one other site, that uh, we have a number of our uh, little furry ancestors. We have one called uh, Paris, I can't even pronounce it, Parasimosimes and Bryceomys that are both found in the Mustn Touch of the Cedar Mountain Formation. So it shows we had the exact same mammals to some degree here in Idaho that we had in Utah 95 million years ago. We had another one called Cedaromys. I tried to find some nice pictures of these guys so you guys could uh, visualize them but they don't get nearly as much attention as Idaho dinosaurs. And it was hard to find a decent image. But we had a number of different little uh, rat-sized mammals running around at this time. Something I'm really proud of though, is a mammal called Simulodon Ackerstoni. If you guys remember, I mentioned my mentor from uh, Idaho State from my undergrad, Bill Ackerston. I was so happy last year. Uh, we got to name a new species of Idaho fossil mammal. This is the oldest fossil mammal known from Idaho. We got to name it for Bill. So Simladon Ackerston I, it's basically Bill Ackerston Simladon. Um, this is from the Wayan Formation and it just uh, tickled me pink to be able to do something nice for my mentor there. So, And I should point out this tooth. This uh, species is based on a single tooth. Um, you can do that with mammals because their teeth are super distinct. But look at the size of this tooth. This is a one millimeter scale bar. This thing is like a quarter of a centimeter in height. These things are hard to recognize. Greg Wilson and Lucas Weaver, formerly of the University of Washington, are the guys that know their mammals, and they've been working on this with me. <clears throat> we have uh, other new species that are upcoming. We have uh, Utriconodontin mammals. Um, here is a tooth, and you can see again, it's one millimeter, it's just tiny. It's just got these three little cusps. We have this jaw. My friend Steve Robison found this at his uh, Robison bone bed. You can see here's the roots to one tooth, another, another. Um, as far as other dinosaurs that we have, I would love to see more of the big animals we had out here. We know they're here, but something's going on again, or we can't find them. We do have a few teeth from a large uh, hadrosaur, like this the duck billed dinosaur. This is Protohadros from uh, Texas, from rocks about the same age. So maybe this is a protohadros-like thing about horse size. All we've got though are like three teeth. It's frustrating. <clears throat> a really tantalizing specimen we have. Armored dinosaurs, so a notosaur. Here's what it would look like down here. Here's his skull. He's got his shoulder spikes, all these bone scoots covering his body. We have a partial skeleton of a notosaur that we found. So this is a tailbone right here. And you can see it's about 10 centimeters from side to side here, the transverse process. So this is a horse sized animal, very least. Here's maybe a fibula or tibia. So a shin bone that's about nine, 10 inches long. This is a good size, massive, bulky animal. 
Um, this guy is kind of in limbo at the moment because um, it's encased in rock. There's probably about two, three years of fossil preparation to do on this. I'm trying to round up student volunteers at ISU once the uh, pandemic is done and we can get them to work on it. But if we can get, you know, just a few four or 500 hours of work out of the students, we can get all the bones out of the rock <coughs> and we can describe this animal. I am super excited because this will be the biggest dinosaur we have from Idaho and I expect it'll be a new species again. It's, I love a Ricto, but it sure is nice when we can see other animals from Idaho too. Small theropods. So the theropods, these are the meat-eating dinosaurs or that uh, oviraptor that was laying the big eggs. We have a lot of teeth from the Robison bone bed showing that we had lots of little meat-eating dinosaurs. Think of the raptors from Jurassic Park. These things would range from the uh, size of a crow or a cat to something the size of a horse. And these all come from the Robison bone bed. As I mentioned before, if we didn't have that one site, if the Forest Service, Caribou Targhee hadn't saved it for us, there'd be about 10 animals that we would never know existed in Idaho. So I'm still, it's just awesome that uh, Caribou Targhee Forest really helped to save those fossils. So teeth right here. <clears throat> here is the tooth of a Tyrannosaur. This is T-Rex's great, 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 whatever grandpa. This is what's called a premaxillary tooth. This is one of the teeth in the front of the maxilla, kind of at the side here. The way we know it's T-Rex is this very distinct shape right here. Or sorry, not T-Rex, so we know it is a Tyrannosaur. Tyrannosaurs have premaxillary teeth that have this very squat kind of U or D-shaped outline at the base. And I should mention, this is not centimeters, this is millimeters. So this isn't even a centimeter long. This is a house cat sized Tyrannosaur. Like I say, one of T-Rex's great, 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 great grandparents. <coughs> raptor teeth from some sort of uh, animal similar to Velociraptor, like you see on the left here. We have right here, again, these teeth, not even a centimeter long. So these are dog sized predators running around in the undergrowth. Another Tyrannosaur, uh, one of the best scenes from Jurassic Park. I love to see a uh, lawyer get eaten by T-Rex while sitting on a toilet, so I have to throw that in. But Tyrannosaurus, I am excited. I am working on describing a, oh, he'd be about horse size again, a horse-sized Tyrannosaur from Idaho, very similar to one called Moros. Moros is this Tyrannosaur right here that's known from the Must and Touch It, those rocks in Utah. I am working on this with Lindsay Zano at the University of North Carolina. We have a thigh bone. It's not the best specimen, but it's something. This is the upper half of the thigh bone. This would fit into the hip socket right here. We have what might be the other half sitting in the lab. I hope that's what it is. It was found in a separate rock, but it looks like it will fit or it looks like it belongs to this animal. So we might have the whole thigh bone. If that is the whole thigh bone, this thigh bone would be just about a foot long, maybe a little bit shorter. Uh, we can tell this is a Tyrannosaur from a bunch of specific anatomy I won't get into, but he basically has certain muscle attachments and certain uh, nerve holes right in the space where only Tyrannosaurs have them. So we have this uh, horse-sized Tyrannosaur running around Idaho about 95 million years ago. <clears throat> uh, something else that really teases me. So at the Robison bone bed, we will find these big carnivorous dinosaur teeth about this big right here. This tooth is about one and a half inches long. The biggest teeth I've seen, um, if complete, would be about two and a half inches long. So this guy is getting, he's not huge like T-Rex, but he's still big enough he could bite your head off. Um, we find these teeth and it's hard to say what they are. They could be from a bigger Tyrannosaur or from a guy related to Allosaurus. In the Mustn't Touch of Utah again, so in those same rocks in Utah of the same age, um, there's a big animal called Seats that's related to Allosaurus. And maybe these are teeth from something similar to Seats, but here is a Seats right here. <clears throat> Just to give some context. So dinosaurs are cool. When I'm out looking for fossils doing research though, I like to look at everything that's there. I think fossil plants in some way uh, make a prehistoric ecosystem a little more real or relatable. Um, in the way end formation, we have one stinking spot, just one, that produces fossil plants, but they are beautiful. You get two different sorts of ferns right here. This one's called glycenia. This is anemia. Or sorry, no, that's another glycenia. This one right here is anemia. 
you get conifer foliage. These are conifer twigs. I didn't know what the heck this was till uh, Brooks Britt pointed out, it's a cross section through a pine cone. If you look right here, you've got a cross section through a pine cone. And right here, you have a nice angiosperm leaf. So you have a flowering plant leaf. Uh, something cool about this fossil, it tells you about the environment. I thought this was the stem when I was first looking at it. Then I noticed on the rock, oh no, the stem's here. And again, Brooks from BYU came to the rescue. He pointed this out, he says, this is a drip point. So in places that get a lot of water, at least part of the year, leaves will have this long, thin point that comes down for water to drip off so they don't smother with too much water. So this tells us that for at least part of the year, when these uh, fossil plants were growing, it was super duper wet. So that tells us a little bit about the climate too. <clears throat> okay, so, so why is this important? So we've got all these different animals in the way in. There's a few different reasons. At this time in the history of uh, the age of dinosaurs, this was a little bit before T-Rex and Triceratops, those Hell Creek Formation dinosaurs you get in Montana that everybody knows. This was a little bit after all the dinosaurs from Utah that people are familiar with, like Stegosaurus and the giant long-necked sauropods. This is in between those two uh, groups of animals. <coughs> this assemblage of the Wayan shows us how these animal communities in North America were changing from one to another. This is a time where in North America, we don't really have any good fossils this age other than from that mustn't touch it in Utah and now from the Wayan in Idaho. So this is right at this uh, transition in the middle of the Cretaceous. The Wayan's interesting too because of what fossils are preserved and why. That's what taphonomy is. Taphonomy is a study of what fossils you have, how they became fossils, and how uh, groups of fossils come together. And the Wayan is important because of Erectodromius, the first burrowing dinosaur, good evidence for the family life an animal. So let's look at that a little bit. So faunal immigration. <clears throat> so I talked about different uh, animals changing in North America about 100 million years ago, going from one sort of group of animals to another. Scientists think part of the reason this might have happened is animals came in from a land bridge from Asia. And we can see evidence for that in the way in. I mentioned we have those macro eggs from giant oviraptorosaurus. I love this thing, it just looks like a cute monster pheasant. But here's your giant oviraptorosaur. These things are found in Asia, in China more specifically, in the Koreas, in Utah, and in Idaho. So that is evidence that you had a land bridge connecting Idaho and Utah there into Asia. Orodromines. That is a group of little burrowing dinosaurs that Erectodromius belongs to. So far, only Erecto is proved as a burrower, but there's a lot of evidence that his relatives did the same. In South Korea, you get an animal similar to Erecto called Koreanosaurus. So you have these little burrowing plant-eating dinosaurs in Asia and in North America. So that's supporting that same thing, that you had animals going back and forth. Plus your Tyrannosauroids that I mentioned. Those are known from Asia. North America. So together, this is good evidence of animals coming across a land bridge from Asia to North America and that affecting and changing ecosystems. <clears throat> so I mentioned the uh, early Cretaceous, uh, late Cretaceous transition. So I won't go into it too much more here, but just to give you an example. So in the early Cretaceous and the late Cretaceous, I should mention the Wayan is just barely in the late Cretaceous, but it's got groups of animals from a uh, that are known from the early Cretaceous and the late. So again, it's evidence for things switching to new groups of animals. So orodromines occur in the early Cretaceous and the late Cretaceous, and Erecto's right there. Sauropods, your big giant long neck guys like here. These guys disappear before we get to the way in. So that's the first casualty as things change. You don't have sauropods in North America for another about 30 million years after Erecto. Your uh, relatives of Allosaurus, they disappear. Your uh, notosaurs, which are a type of ankylosaur, for the most part, they disappear. But the Wayan has animals from the late Cretaceous, early Cretaceous, showing that it's straddling that boundary as uh, animal groups change. <clears throat> okay, taphonomy. So I mentioned taphonomy is a study of what fossils you get, why you have them, what happened to them, how they became a fossil. And I mentioned the Wayan is weird because it has little dinosaurs like a Ricto that should be super rare. And your big animals are rare when you should be finding them compared to other places. You'd expect going out in the way in that you'd be finding big bones like any other place you look for dinosaurs. 
for the life of me, I cannot find any big bones out there. It drives me nuts. So what the heck is going on? <clears throat> okay, here's what I think is going on. So the title of this talk, Idaho Dinosaurs, They Dug Their Own Graves. This was part of my PhD dissertation. Uh, part of my hypothesis, and we had a lot of data that supported this, is we think we have a lot of Ericto in the Wayan Formation because these guys are digging their own graves. They're living underground. That's going to become their grave if they're not careful. If they die down there and there's a flood later, it's going to fill in their burrow and preserve them. If you've got an uh, unfortunate little family group, a, a mom and two kiddos or dad and two kiddos, or sometimes we'll find adults together in these burrows. But if you've got them down there and they're uh, sleeping or not paying attention or there's just a sudden flood, it buries them and smothers them. I think that's what's going on um, in the Wayan Formation is we have these animals spending part of their life underground. So that's why we're finding them now. They're getting buried. I think if you are living and then dying up on top of the ground, there's not enough sediment to bury your big bones and preserve them as much. But if you're digging your own grave, you're going to be easier to find. That's what I think was going on. That's why I say these guys dug their own graves. So evidence for this. If we look at the erectodromous bones that we find, they're not scattered like you would expect if they're on the ground surface. Like think of a cow skeleton scatter you'd see when you're out walking around where they're spread over, you know, dozens of square meters. The ricto bones are always found right next to each other in bony clumps. Um, there's no damage on them. There's no uh, predation marks. There's no weathering from the uh, rain and the wind and the sun. They're pristine. So it seems to show that these bones were buried super fast. Plus when we find them in burrows, we know that. The ghost chicken, or the boneless chicken, the macro eggs. If we look at the, uh, uh, do a thin section, cut through the egg shell, and look at the pores in the shell, the pores indicate that these eggs were buried by the parents. So same thing, we're finding lots of these eggs because the parents were burying them to incubate them. All the other animals we find, almost all of them come from that Robinson bone bed where they were buried by a high energy deposit. It's a conglomerate, excuse me, and it looks like it was formed from a big storm event that just suddenly buried a bunch of stuff. So for me, all this evidence together supports that Idaho at this time was weird. You'd get animals in burrows getting buried. You'd get eggs that were buried by the parents preserved, but anything living and dying on the ground waiting to get buried by a bigger storm, it just didn't happen. Idaho didn't have that sort of uh, environment at the time. <clears throat> so a little bit of summary, Idaho dinosaurs, they are super weird. I love them. You have the Wayan assemblage. It's dominated by burrowing animals. We have a lot of different animals that are found, but a lot of them are super duper rare. Um, your armored dinosaurs, like I say, we have that one skeleton, and in 20 years of looking, that's all we found for a big dinosaur that's represented by more than a bone. We have teeth from lots of different dinosaurs. Um, we maybe have isolated bone here and there of other dinosaurs, but most things aren't known from a lot but I think there's lots of potential. Uh, the little mammal teeth, uh, to me that's an uh, indication that Wayan might be good for microvertebrates. That just means for tiny fossils. If we go out and collect hundreds and hundreds of pounds of weathered rock and then screen and sift through it, I suspect we can find more mammal teeth and tiny, uh, say crocodile teeth, fish teeth, and dinosaur teeth. <clears throat> okay, a uh, larger potential. So part of what I wanna do in Idaho um, as I uh, gain a, a professional career, is I want to look at everything else. So here's the Wayan Formation in a stratigraphic column. Here's another formation I've worked in called the Thanes. It's Triassic, but I'll just briefly mention in a minute. All these things not highlighted in red. No one's looked for dinosaurs or other fossil uh, vertebrates, fossil boned animals in them. Up above here, more Cretaceous, no one has. So for a chunk of my career, I want to take time and look at all these other things and see what we could find in them. I think there's a ton of potential. So yeah, a lot of potential left in the Cretaceous of Idaho, questions I want to uh, ask. So if I get out of Idaho, if I get into uh, Western Wyoming there, south of you guys, there's the uh, Thomas Fork Formation, Cokeville and uh, Quealy. Those are the uh, Eastern equivalents of the way in. Um, no one's looked at them in 20 years as far as dinosaurs, no one looked at them much to begin with. I want to get out there, see if there's a Ricto, other animals in there. I want to see if I can find evidence for Rictodromius laying eggs underground. If you're raising your kids in a burrow, I don't know why you wouldn't be laying your eggs down there. It doesn't make sense otherwise. We just haven't found evidence for that. 
I want to find larger animals in the way in. I would absolutely love to find that giant uh, ghost chicken. Uh, I'd love to s figure out more things about how Erichthydromius and his relatives, how they evolved and changed as they came from Asia or got to Asia from North America, whichever way they were going. And I think it's interesting to see how the animals we have here in Idaho relate to uh, those in the uh, Cedar Mountain Formation, unless and touch it, member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. Oh, okay. just to give you guys an idea, the Idaho um, dinosaur range stuff is more than just dinosaurs. Really quick, I'm gonna show, share with you some other things I work on. So I like to work in uh, the oceans. I like to dip my toes in the water of ancient oceans. Here in Idaho, in the Triassic, about 250 million year old rocks, we have a lot of world-class fossils that we're starting to find. Uh, this picture right here is from a spot near Bear Lake um, of a site called the uh, Paris Biota that myself and some colleagues have worked on. Um, it's pretty cool because it's full of dozens of different animals found right after the worst extinction in the Earth's history, the Permian extinction. You've got lobsters and sharks and marine reptiles and echinoderms related to starfish and sponges and shrimps, a whole bunch of cool animals. I want to look for fish and reptiles and that stuff. Another thing I'm interested in, I'm working on at a fossil site down near Bear Lake, the origin of life. So the first multicellular life. Um, if you guys know trilobites, a lot of people like them. There's a great trilobite spot near Bear Lake called Spence Gulch. Um, it holds a lot of clues to the evolution of early life in Idaho. And I'm working on that with some colleagues um, in Utah right now. A little bit out of my forte, I'm working on a giant bird nest site full of uh, Eocene eggshell and bird bones. And getting back to a Ricto, next week I'm excited to actually look in dinosaur rich rocks. The Morrison Formation, if you guys know the Morrison, I would love to get out in the Morrison. I'm planning to get out to Wyoming next year to look for relatives of a Ricto in the older Morrison Formation rocks, about 150 million years old. There's an animal called Nanosaurus. Here's a skeleton of Nano right here. I suspect that this animal burrowed just like a Ricto and had a similar lifestyle. I intend and hope to get out into the Morrison Formation of Wyoming, find more nanos, and see if we can find them in burrows. So yeah, just as far as acknowledgments, everyone in these pictures uh, helped me get through my PhD and has helped me with my research. Um, thanks to everybody there, all my mentors. And okay, now it's question time. <clears throat> I will, let's see, uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, can everyone hear me? This is Mike. So the first question for you, LJ, the uh, crocs, the puppy sized crocs, mm -hmm. are, are those adults or are those a different species that are just a very small crocodile? Oh, that's a good question. So don't totally quote me on this, but from what I call the specimen, it's going to be an adult because all of the uh, cranial bones are fused. So they're fused together. So most likely it's going to be an adult of a very small crocodile. That's a good question. Uh, where is the Robinson bone bed? Uh, you know, caribou targi, but can you be a little more specific? Oh, Forest Service wouldn't want me to give away the exact location, but I can say no. it's west of uh, Palisades Reservoir. Okay. Out in the mountains there. Yeah. Problem there is it's uh, the plants have grown over all the rock. You just go out there and smash the rock with sledgehammers to find bones. Now it's getting hard to find the rock again. Uh, was it perhaps the climate that made there not be large dinosaurs in in the in this formation? Yeah, it could have been could have been you know way too hot. Not enough plants there. Um, I mean, we'll find those bits and pieces of it. That could be part of it very well, though. Maybe it just wasn't a lot of food for big animals. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of it, too. Okay. Could you characterize a modern-day equivalent environment so that we can sort of understand in today's terms what this would have been like? I can give you a rough guess. That's something I've thought about and tried to think of a good idea. Um, so the guy that first found little hints of Idaho dinosaurs was uh, John Doerr from the University of Michigan in the 80s. And he compared the Wayan to the uh, foothills of the Himalayas, a little bit lower, where you transition from kind of the drier step and then you get into the more lush as you come down to the uh, ocean there. And I think that's a fairly good analogy. Maybe the rivers 
maybe wasn't quite as wet, but I think, you know, something at the toe of some big mountains there where you're in between getting dry and going down to swampy lowlands to an ocean would be best. But that's, that's my best comparison for what John had to say. Okay. Uh, so the Wyan is a mile thick. What's the time frame for the deposition of that? Um, so best guess again. So when we did our, uh, the trial of zircon dating, it wasn't as precise as we'd like. Um, we got margins of error of about one to two million years, but I would be comfortable saying maybe about 101 to 94, 95 million years ago. So maybe six, seven million years. So it's, you know, a fair amount of time, but still awful thick. And it's probably because you had super fast subsidence from that encroaching, uh, highlands making a big uh, four deep to fill in with a lot of sediment fairly fast and and the slide where you showed the seaway is that the cretaceous seaway that yep. that is an interior cretaceous seaway it's called the maori seaway the way in is partially equivalent to like the maori shale you get there in wyoming too so uh we have a question asking if you could comment on fossil feathers. Um, so let's see. So are you, I'm guessing maybe they're thinking about dinosaur feathers. Um, so we haven't, the rocks in the way in, they are not the best to find anything like that. Um, I would absolutely love to. I suspect that our little meeting dinosaurs, little tyrannosaur and the raptors that we find the teeth from, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure that they were feathered to some degree. Every fossil they find now in China, these animals where you have really fine grained rocks, they're fuzzy. So I expect that a lot of these animals were fuzzy um, with feathers, even a ricto. There's a, a guy called Calindodromius from Asia that's about twice as old as a ricto, but roughly in the same group of animals. And he had feathers and fuzz and it's crazy. So I wouldn't be surprised even if a ricto had some sort of dino fuzz or dino feathers. Uh. One of the things what struck me is when you talk about burrowing dinosaurs, and I think about how dinosaurs survived in the South Polar region. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no ice in Antarctica, there were forests, and there were dinosaurs, yet they still had six months of darkness to contend with. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, this seems like a strategy that might make sense. Could you comment on that? Yeah, that, that's a good point. So um, one of my co-authors on this paper with the borough, uh, Tony Martin, a uh, great ichnologist, guy that works on dinosaur traces, um, he described a burrow from rocks in Australia, about 10 million years older than the way in, so about 110 million years old. Um, in these rocks of southern Australia, he found a burrow that looks just like an erecto burrow, same dimensions, same little S-curve, and separately in those rocks, not in this burrow itself, but in other places in those rocks, they found little dinosaurs just like a ricto. So I think you're hitting the nail on the head there, and these guys are probably doing the same thing. I think that burrowing is probably something that's, um, it's hard to find evidence for, especially if you're just looking at bones, because you'll think of a, like a mole that's super adapted for a burrowing. If you look at his arm bones, they're super gnarly, full of muscle attachments. You can recognize that. If you look at a rabbit, which can also dig, you'd look at rabbit bones, you wouldn't expect that. It doesn't have big beefy bones. But I think um, that a lot of dinosaurs, at least smaller ones may have done this, and we just haven't recognized the burrows. A colleague in North Dakota just did a talk last year on a relative of Triceratops, it's you know about uh, hog size that probably burrowed. So I think that was probably a more common thing than people expect. Uh, <clears throat> does burrowing suggest estivation or hibernation? It suggested, I don't know a way to prove it, but I wouldn't rule it out. I don't have a way to prove it, but I wouldn't be surprised. People have talked about um, a dinosaur from South Africa where they haven't found burrows, but for whatever reason they were suggesting maybe it estivated. But yeah, I would not be surprised. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, LJ, thank you for an amazing introduction to Idaho dinosaurs. And, and we're so glad that when you were told there weren't any, that you went out and found them. And, hey, uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, 
I want to thank you on behalf of the geologists of Jackson Hole and all of our participants for a great talk. And we look forward to getting you over here in person when that uh, becomes possible. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm just, I'm seeing a few comments here. You didn't see the burrow, so sorry. Um, yeah. So email me at uh, one of those uh, addresses on the first slide and I'll just send you the paper with the link and you guys can see the burrow. Sorry about that. So. No. No, that would be terrific. So if there are no more questions, uh, again, LJ, thank you very much. What a terrific talk. And uh, we'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see everybody beginning of September. Huh? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. If you find any cool fossils, let me know. So. <laughs> we, I, I have some dinosaur tracks I'm going to send you pictures of. Cool, cool. It'll be fun to see. So. You can come see him in person. Oh, I wouldn't mind. I need to get up there with my kiddos once it's uh, COVID free. So it would be nice. Okay. Well, thank you. And, yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Good night, everyone. See ya. <laughs>